Namaste and welcome to my channel. First of all, I would like to thank all my subscribers for helping me hit the 10,000 mark. Thank you so much for being there together with me in my journey as the channel grows. So this is going to be our 52nd video on the channel and we are going to continue with the series that we had started which is on facial nerve palsy. Now today I'm going to start with the management part of it that is the surgical management. Now since there are a lot of regions that are addressed in case of facial nerve palsy we will take them one by one. So what are the areas that are affected and what are the ones that are going to require surgical intervention. So in case of facial nerve palsy on the affected side there will be involvement of the brow leading to brow ptosis. There will be involvement of the upper eyelid and of the lower eyelid. So both of these need to be addressed depending on the patient's symptoms. Then there is involvement of the nose that is in the form of the nasal airway. And as we all know the most popular one is the involvement of the upper lip and the lower lip especially the one that affects the smile. So we'll take all these regions one by one and first we're going to start with the brow. Now what happens in the case of the brow in case of facial nerve palsy? So because the frontalis muscle on the affected side is paralyzed it leads to drooping on that side which is known as brow ptosis. Now this is going to cause the eyebrow on the same side to come down and obviously cause asymmetry as well as it is going to create weight on the periorbital region and on the region of the upper eyelid as well. So now to address this region of laxity that is the brow ptosis there are few static procedures as well as few dynamic procedures. Now number one in case of the aged elderly population where there is a lot of skin laxity in those cases a static procedure of direct brow excision can be done. So the skin as well as the frontalis muscle, a chunk of the tissue just above the region of the eyebrow is excised and then it is sutured back together to help lift the brow on the affected side. So not only skin, even portion of the frontalis muscle is excised and therefore the muscle is plicated again and then the skin is approximated. So that is direct brow excision. Now the second one is a formal brow lift. Now a brow lift can further be endoscopic or it can be done through a small coronal incision as well. So in case of brow lift we need to have a form of pulley system and we need to have a lever which is going to help lift the brow on the affected side. So that can be done with the help of a fascia for example fascia lata taken from the thigh or it can be done with the help of a tendon sling such as palmaris longus or plantaris. Now depending on the brow lift whether it is through a coronal incision or whether it is endoscopic the graft is passed through the incision underneath it goes to the region of the brow and it hooks around it and comes back and then the knot is tied in this region. So it's going to create a sling effect for the brow lift. Now for this you have to know that this has to be anchored to a specific area in the temporal region as well. So commonly the temporalis fascia which gives a strong hold is selected for the same reason. Now the third thing that can be done because this causes a lot of asymmetry with the opposite side. So in cases where you need to balance this out as well and only a surgical procedure on the affected side is inadequate or in some cases the surgery is not done but you just need to balance out both the sides then on the opposite side you can go in for Botox. So Botox obviously is going to temporarily weaken the strong muscle on the normal side which is going to help create symmetry in both the regions. So that is an overview of what is done in case of brow ptosis in cases of facial palsy. Now coming to the region of the eyelid. Now the temporalis muscle transfer, the temporalis sling is the important topic but because that is a bigger topic I am going to cover it separately in another video. 
So what else can we do for the eyelid? Now in certain cases of lid lag, that is because the levator palpebrae superioris muscle, that is the LPS is going to be acting. In fact, it is going to be overacting and the orbicularis oculi muscle is going to be weakened. There is going to be a problem in the eyelid closure. So because there is going to be a problem in eyelid closure, there is going to be a risk of corneal exposure. So in these cases, what can be done as a static procedure again is that gold weight can be placed in the region of the tarsal plate. Now the gold weight usually approximates 0 0.8 to 1.2 grams. Sometimes even platinum weight is used. Now this is placed in such a way that the gold weight should not show through the eyelid skin also because the eyelid skin is very very thin so you have to be sure of the placement and it has to be placed directly above at the region of the tarsal plate now this is a static procedure and the patient has to be trained that when they close their eyes they have to voluntarily try and block the action of the levator palpebrae superioris so that the weight due to gravity can then come down and help in closure of the upper eyelid also an important point is that this insertion has to be away from the region of the Muller's muscle and therefore the placement has to be decided pre-op with the patient in sitting position and by assessing how much of the lid function the patient has. Now the next thing that can be done for the region of the upper eyelid is that the spring can be inserted. Now this is just uh, of academic interest. So a spring which is known as a morel fatio spring can also be inserted in through the region where it is just below the lateral end of the brow and it goes up till the region of the upper eyelid. Now this actually has a spring mechanism so when the patient attempts to open the eye forcefully the spring action recoils and it helps in closure of the upper eyelid. So that is the third thing. So we have number one the gold or platinum weight we have number two that is the sorry number two that is the spring action and then number three would be a tarso raffi now a tarso raffi is considered to be the um, final procedure i would say that is it is uh, in certain cases a palliative procedure because it is going to uh, close both the tarsal plates together and is going to lead in closure of that eye. So it can be a temporary tarsoraphy or it can be a permanent one. But this is usually the last resort because obviously you're blocking the visual function of that eye. Now what do you do for the region of the lower eyelid? Again temporalis is an option which will be seen in the following videos. Now for the lower eyelid what is going to happen is that there is going to be laxity and there's going to be ectropion and scleral show and there's going to be constant tearing from that region of the eyelid because of loss of the tone. So now a tendon sling again in the form of palmaris or plantaris can be inserted. Usually for this region the tendon is preferred as opposed to the fascia because the fascia can lose its tone in the long run because it will get stretched out. So the tendon sling has to go from the medial to the lateral region and then it is used as a hammock to give back the tone to the lower eyelid. And this has to be inserted well above in the region of the lateral brow. So it's not that it has to be only just where the lower eyelid is, but it has to go all the way up till the zygomatico frontal suture line where the Wittnall's tubercle lies. Similarly, a lateral canthopexy is done where the lower eyelid as well as the lateral canthus are supported and plicated up to give it a hammock effect. Furthermore, a cartilage graft can be taken and help to strengthen the tarsal plate in this region. And finally is the region of the nose. Because of the facial muscles, that is the nasalis muscle, as well as the levator superior aliquinase is going to be affected, it's going to lead to loss of tone of the nasal airway on that side and therefore it is going to lead in decreased passage of air from the affected side. So in these cases a formal septoplasty can be done 
or again an LR base elevation can be performed as a static procedure or again a small sling can be used to lift the ala on that side as well as open up the airway. So these are the three things that we have discussed in this video and in the upcoming videos I'm going to go in depth and explain about the use of the temporalis transfer for the upper as well as the lower eyelid.